All right, it's seven o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am very, very excited to have my friend and former co-resident Julia Finkelstein joining us today for this morning's Empire Urology Lecture Series. Uh, welcome, Julia. Super glad to have you here. Um, I will just give you a quick introduction to anyone who's on the call who doesn't know you. Uh, Dr. Finkelstein is currently a fellow in pediatric urology at Boston Children's Hospital in Massachusetts, um, uh, where she's completing her uh, pediatric fellowship as, as well as a uh, patient safety and quality improvement fellowship through the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, before that, Julia and I spent a long time together at Columbia as co-residents um, where she decided to pursue a career in pediatric urology. So Julia, before we get started, I was hoping that you can just tell us a little bit about your decision-making process. I know that the, um, the people who have just applied into pediatric urology for the next cycle are all done, but I think this is a big decision point for a lot of, uh, a lot of residents when they're kind of deciding what to do next, you know, the rising, the rising uh, chief residents, the rising senior residents. So if you give us a little insight, that would be great. Sure. Um, thank you, Alex. I'm excited to be able to give this talk today. And for me, I have to be honest, I was always kind of peds biased. Um, I forgot about it. I loved urology very much and did a lot of endo urology during my second year of residency. But then when I did peds as a PGY3, as a junior resident, I remembered why I loved it. And um, you know, I love working with the kids every day. It's a, it's a very hot, heavy operative um, field, but you get to do the full breadth of surgery. It's a little less specialized in the adult side. So you can do the full range of, you know, cancer to small little kind of plastics procedure. And what really for me meant a lot for peds is that the repairs that you're doing really have to be long lasting. The kids are young and they have the rest of their lives to live. And I think just the duration and the meaning of what you're doing um, really sealed the deal for me. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions that folks um, have. That's great. Thanks so much. I think a lot of people are, you know, there's a lot of anxiety right now among residents and students who are looking ahead toward their next step in the career path. I heard that the um, pediatric interview process this year was all virtual and I actually heard really good things. Do you have any insight into that process? And uh, before we talk about taking care of patients, uh, what about taking care of uh, your uh, other residents and future fellows on tele, tele interviewing? Yeah, I mean, I think that it went well across the board. I think all the programs, there might've been a few prior to COVID that were able to have in-person interviews, but for the most part, the pediatric fellowship interviews were all over um, telehealth and we we did it as well we just had one day um, we did it an interesting way in that since we weren't able to kind of have those in-person interactions we assigned each group to a set of questions to cover a specific facet of the applicant's life so like this is their personal life this is their career goals this is their research so that way this it wasn't repeated throughout their process and I thought that was a, a interesting way of handling it I think we got good feedback I have to say as a fellow interviewing um, the applicants that way, it was not the same as in person because you just don't have those same casual conversations kind of walking between interviews or at the dinner. Um, but I still feel like I got to know the candidates pretty well. Yeah, that's good to that's good to hear. I think we're all going to be in that same ship pretty soon trying to figure out the urology match and how to do that virtually. So anyway, thanks for that insight. I'm going to turn the podium over to you and uh, you can go ahead and start your talk. If you could try to leave about uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. People usually post their questions in the chat box and then uh, we'll review them together at the end. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so Alex already kind of gave my introduction. And for me, um, as someone who has an interest in quality improvement and urology, telemedicine was sort of the perfect overlap for me. So I'm excited to give you this um, presentation on the ramping up of telemedicine. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. Uh, this morning, I'll provide an introduction to telemedicine, including defining some of the terms used. I'll touch on the benefits of telemedicine, its use in urology, and updates on billing. Finally, I will address website matter in some future directions. While not a novel concept, telemedicine has revolutionized the delivery of medical care. It was originally created to treat patients who were located in remote places, but is increasingly accepted by patients and clinicians as a valuable tool to provide real-time, convenient medical care for all. 
In response to the COVID-19 pandemic that struck the globe, the medical world has converted most, if not all outpatient appointments to some type of telemedicine visit, which has brought this topic to the forefront. Many terms are used when describing telehealth and tele telemedicine, often in interchangeable ways. So I'd like to just quickly clarify the terminology. Telehealth encompasses a broader definition of remote healthcare that does not always involve clinical care. We can think of telehealth as information and communication technologies that improve our overall health and which encompass all aspects of medical care. Whereas telemedicine refers to technologies used specifically for diagnosing and treating disease, it is a subset of telehealth. Asynchronous telemedicine describes store and forward transmission of medical images and data with a provider at a different location because the data transfer takes place over a period of time and typically in separate time frames. There can be a time delay between when the message is sent, when it is received, and when response is communicated. The most familiar example to you is probably email. Clinically speaking, it may be a patient submitting a picture of a wound or a rash, and this form of telemedicine is most commonly used in teleradiology or teledermatology. When people think of telemedicine, the most popular image is probably a doctor consulting with a patient via a video chat platform. Real-time or synchronous telemedicine is a live interaction. It generally involves interactive video connections that transmit information in both directions during the same time period. It involves the capture, processing, and presentation of data at the time the data is originated. In other words, the participants interact as if they were in the same room and it is a virtual alternative to the traditional in-person clinic doctor's appointment. Normally telemedicine is conducted through telemedicine platforms that are dedicated and designed to protect health information from hacking and accidental disclosure. Conventional internet-based audiovisual applications such as Skype and FaceTime do not meet these required standards. However, temporary relaxation of certain security restrictions during the pandemic have been necessary to facilitate SWIFT's adoption of telemedicine. If you must use non-HIPAA compliant software, patients and families should be informed of the privacy risks prior to conducting the visit. However, in the long term, I urge that virtual platforms should be HIPAA compliant and secure since you are discussing and revealing protected health information. Telemedicine visits can be provided by a full breadth of qualified healthcare professionals as defined by Medicare, which includes physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurse midwives, clinician nurse specialists, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, as well as dietitians. So what are some of the benefits of telemedicine? There are many suggested benefits for patients. Simply put, telemedicine's value for patients is time and money saved without compromising quality of care. And there are trends, at least within behavioral health, that patients have shown increased adherence to longitudinal care through telemedicine. Finally, studies show that patients maintain or improve engagement and satisfaction with their physicians via telemedicine. For providers, seeing established low acuity patients via telemedicine can free up clinical time for new or more complex patients. Televisits also allow more efficient patient care. The clinic process is reduced to patients logging into the visit, interacting with the urologist, and logging off. The improved timeliness of communication between providers may also enhance interdisciplinary patient care. This is one benefit in telemedicine that I recently became interested in. The healthcare sector has contributed substantially to climate change. Telemedicine has emerged as one solution for decreasing the environmental footprint of healthcare. Clearly, eliminating travel to and from appointments reduces the emission of greenhouse and non greenhouse gas emissions, as well as fossil fuel consumption. In a large state like California that is roughly 800 miles long, the University of California Davis Health System, patients could save an average of 278 miles of round trip travel if all in person consultations were replaced by telemedicine encounters. We decided to look at this at Boston Children's Hospital. We analyzed the reduction in carbon footprint by telemedicine visits completed during the first month of COVID-19 from March 16th to April 15th, as March 16th was when we decided to convert as many of our in-person visits as we could to telemedicine. 
During this time, we completed more than 23,000 virtual visits with an average round trip travel distance of 54 miles saved and a total of over 1.2 miles saved. This results in a reduction of 467 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, 14.4 kilograms of fine particulate matter, 48,000 gallons of fossil fuel use, and $119,000 of avoided expenditure on fuel. This is equivalent to the carbon that would be sequestered in 11.4 square miles of U.S. forests in one year. Why does this matter? Greenhouse gases worsen climate change, and climate change may have severe negative impacts on human health and livelihoods. In addition, other traffic-related emissions of various pollutants, such as the fine particulate matter, also contribute greatly to pediatric and adult disease burden, with several studies demonstrating increased risk of respiratory and cardiovascular disease associated with close residential proximity to traffic pollution. There's also evidence that long-term exposure to air pollution increases mortality. All of this being said, pediatric telemedicine encounters represent a minor proportion of the total healthcare provided in the region. And the true potential of telemedicine lies in scaling this model of care to all patient groups across the state and nation. Which brings me to the question, what is the role of telemedicine in neurology? In 2016, the AUA Telemedicine Workgroup sought to describe the current and future state of telemedicine technology and highlighted these main obstacles to implementation of telemedicine neurology, including the inconsistencies among technological devices, issues with reimbursement, as well as barriers within licensing and regulatory guidelines. This is a re review paper from 2019 that sought to examine the application of telehealth within neurologic practice over the prior 10 years. They found 24 articles with the most common application using a video visit to assess or follow up patients. The second most common use within neurology was to, to perform telementorship. Again, they noted that while telemedicine as a concept is widely recognized by physicians, it has not gained widespread use within neurology due to the many hurdles that I've mentioned on the previous slide, including the barriers at the state and federal regulatory level. Finally, Dr. Badalotto and colleagues just prior to COVID evaluated the role of telemedicine neurology. They performed a web-based survey and they found that only 14% of respondents were actively using telemedicine in their work. The most commonly cited barrier to implementation was the inability to effectively bill for services. Had this study been done a little bit later, I'm sure that the results would be astoundingly different. This brings me to an update on billing to explain why the state of telemedicine has dramatically changed during this public health emergency. Both the AUA and the American Academy of Pediatrics have held webinars addressing this. I do think it's important to touch upon since house staff generally don't get much exposure to billing during training, but I won't go into it too much since these webinars are a great resource. Under the 1135 waiver that passed, there have been changes to certain Medicare telehealth requirements and billing practices. Before I go into these, I must address some caveats. Not all organizations will interpret these changes the same. They will have individual interpretations and may implement the billing processes differently. Not all insurance companies will follow Medicare's telehealth deregulation, and state laws may differ from federal laws. With this in mind, it is best to check with your state hospital and practice manager to see how new guidelines have been implemented by individual insurers and how this will apply to your practice. However, with the waiver, Medicare will now fully pay and reimburse for office, hospital, and other visits furnished via telehealth to a beneficiary. Telehealth may be used for both new and established patients, which is the change traditionally it was just for established patients, but now it can be provided for new patients as well. And it may also be provided in the home setting. In addition, there's no limit on what conditions are eligible for telehealth visit, leaving this judgment to the discretion of the provider. It appears that state Medicaid and CHIP agencies are following lead of Medicare in the coverage of telehealth. In terms of commercial insurance, the coding committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics Section of Neurology compiled this list here of current major insurers and their current coverage of video and telephone visits. 
I won't get into the weeds of reimbursement, but if you're interested, there are updates to commercial and payer coverage available through the American Medical Association website listed here. Next, I will share some quick and easy coding tables. Again, new visits may be provided through telehealth for the duration of the public health emergency. These should be coded using 99201 through 99205 and are based upon medical decision making or time spent with the patient. Established video visits are being reversed at the same rate as regular in-person visits. Established video visits should be coded using 99212 through 99215 and are also based upon medical decision making or time. Medicare now also bills for telephone visits, which is new during the public health emergency. This can be an important option for older patients who may not be as tech savvy and eager to jump onto a telehealth portal. These telephone visits can now be performed for new and established patients and are billed using time. Time should be billed based upon the time required to have a medical discussion with the patient and does not include the time used for chart review or documentation. Phone visits are typically billed using the codes 99441 through 99443. Traditionally, you must have been licensed in the state where the patient is located to provide telemedicine for that patient. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many states have either lifted their licensing needs or enabled temporary licensing guidelines. However, this is a state level issue, and if you want to find out more information, please go to the Federation of State Medical Boards website. So now with these regulatory and reimbursement changes, where does telemedicine stand within urology? Certainly, the pandemic provided the impetus for swift implementation and expansion of telehealth services, and this is true within urology. In my PubMed search, I already found about 10 publications about the application of telemedicine in urology over the past few months, and I'm sure that there will be more coming down the pipeline. I want to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our experience at Boston Children's Hospital. We have a homegrown telemedicine platform. Families download HIPAA compliant video conferencing software that's provided free of charge from an internet link that's sent to their email address. The software can connect to providers via Wi-Fi or cellular connections and patients can use any computer or mobile device that has a webcam. Currently, we have 44 departments that are engaged in our telemedicine program with neurology, gastroenterology, and psychiatry, psychology representing the three highest users. During the pandemic, we have performed almost 40,000 virtual visits. This figure shows by zip code the distribution of telemedicine services provided by Boston Children's Hospital within the state of Massachusetts. So you can see that we are providing some aspect of pediatric care for most of the state. We have surveys that go out to the families as well as the providers at the completion of the telemedicine visit. Mean patient satisfaction with the experience was 9.3 out of 10. Mean provider satisfaction was similar at 9.5 out of 10. The estimated travel cost savings is $384 per patient, and the time saved is estimated to be four hours of patient travel time round trip. I had very fortunate timing in that we launched our pediatric urology telemedicine program in November of 2017 in the fall of my first year of fellowship. I was able to be involved with the design and implementation of it. It began as three physicians and some nurses using technology to make sure that we felt it was feasible and safe. Now all physicians, nurses, as well as a dedicated clinical psychologist use te telemedicine within our department. And we have integrated telemedicine as a routine component in post-operative care. As I will show you, patients obtain post-operative imaging locally and this is reviewed with the provider virtually. To evaluate this program, we compared 107 virtual and 100 in-person post-operative visits. I'll take a minute to highlight some of the key findings of this study. We found that travel and waiting for care accounted for 98.4% of the total time spent for an in-person visit, quite a lot. To participate in the virtual visit, significantly less work and school were missed by parents and children. The opportunity cost associated with an in-person visit 
was calculated at $23.75 per minute of FaceTime with the physician, compared to $1.14 for a virtual visit. Here's an example of one of the virtual visits that our provider performed. This is an adolescent female who's wheelchair bound and would have taken a great deal of resources to get her for an in-person visit. How have you been since you've been home? Pretty good. Yeah. Um, there's been any problems or anything. Jerry's been clear. Great. So, scabs are kind of off now. So Scabs off on the back. That's good. As yeah, you yeah. can see, I mean, this is your right kidney here. That's the one that's super stretched. And it remains stretched. That's okay. Um, but you can see there's black fluid in there all the way through here. And there's no stones, no stone debris. It's, you've got the left kidney here, which drains straight down. And then the right kidney, which is really stretched and quite thin. That's the one that drains across. And then that drains into the bladder, which is a little off to your left side. So what they're detecting is this swelling right here. Okay. Uh, but the good news is, you know, you had stones here, here, and then in uh, almost every one of these spots, as well as eventually in your bladder with a couple dozen of them. So um, those are, I mean, to the, to the best of the imaging today, all gone. How have you... So that was one example of a, of a telemedicine visit provided to an adolescent female. And as you can see, um, communicating virtually can be quite different than an in-person visit. How do we effectively do this over telemedicine? We know the patient report is extremely important and that good side matter has a positive effect on patient health outcomes. It's easy to overlook this in telemedicine, but a pra practicing effective virtual communication or what we've termed as website manner is also very important to maintain the physician-patient relationship across the distance. This virtual communication may require modifications to traditional bedside manner in order to provide a good experience. For my first foray in qualitative research, I tried to explore the effective use of telemedicine by leading fo some focus groups of a diverse group of pediatric telemedicine providers at Boston Children's Hospital. We interviewed them asking about um, their safe and effective use of telemedicine. And one theme that emerged was that provider comfort, confidence, and flexibility with telemedicine technology was critical to the success of the visit. One provider eloquently said, I think it's getting more comfortable behind the camera. It's just being less stiff and sort of bringing what I bring to the bedside to the camera and trying to remember that and not being uncomfortable with the media part of this. Based on this feedback and experience, I put together a table of tips to ready yourself and the environment. Some of it likely seems obvious, but I just wanna make a few points. In order to achieve eye contact, you need to look at the camera. Truthfully, this takes practice, focusing on the camera rather than the patient's image on the monitor so it doesn't appear that you are looking down. Lots of hand motions can be distracting and may be cut off depending on the camera's frame of view. Minor movements can also seem exaggerated to the patient, so it's important to stay seated, avoid fidgeting, and minimize hand motions. Here are some other suggestions. In an office visit, we typically introduce ourselves to the patient and those accompanying the patient. It is essential to still verify who is on the patient end virtually. Relatively early in the virtual visit, you should also check and make sure that the patient can hear you well enough. At the start of the visit, it is important to remind them that their privacy and confidentiality is the same as for an in-person visit. If you are reviewing the electronic medical record or taking notes, they would know this in person, but virtually they can't see what you're doing, so it's important to inform them. Finally, at the end of the visit, leave time for questions as patients may be more hesitant to ask them in the virtual setting. To be quite honest, providers expressed mixed feelings about their telemedicine experience. I'll give you an example of both a positive and a negative impression that a provider gave. On the positive side, I just feel that I have an ability to still connect with patients the way that I like to. I still take in information the way I do as a clinician. I do look around the room. I do look at siblings. I do look at the interaction of parents, those kind of things. So it's not an isolated FaceTime experience. I expected it to be kind of a little bit sterile or super removed, I think. 
So this doctor highlighted how video visits gives them the chance to see patients in their home surroundings. On the end, other end of things, one provider said, I found that some of my patients have used this as a liberty to change the way this relationship is going to work. That all of a sudden, now all the kids can run around. All of a sudden, other things can go on, like the plumber coming in to fix the house at the same time as our visit. Now, I know some of these things are out of control. Like I get a page in the middle of a visit and I have to step out of an appointment. So it happens. But my impression is that the percentage of times that this happens is higher when they're in their home environment versus when they're in our office environment. So the setting can also change the dynamics of the doctor-patient relationship. Furthermore, providers have expressed frustration with workflow changes and incorporating new innovations. Though telemedicine stands to improve patient access to care, access to namely the internet or to mobile devices remains a limiting factor for patients. Where access is not an issue, familiarity with technology and ease of use are barriers to options, especially in older patient populations. Of course, certain physical examinations may need to be completed in person. This can be particularly challenging with regards to a general exam. Within pediatrics, the caregiver can be coached to perform specific maneuvers to elicit physical findings. Still in our hands, we've found that about 80% of patients are amenable to virtual physical exams and about 20% are better served coming into the office. We may see them initially um, in a virtual visit, but if they have undescended testicles or hypospadias, we likely will need to bring them in for an office visit before we would pr proceed with surgery. Here's a quote that one of the pediatric providers gave that I think summarizes some of these challenges. Sometimes physical exam is it's impossible. Either you can't figure out how to focus the camera, kids moving, or their bandwidth is horrible, so it's like this blurred image anyway. A lot of it they can't get, and eventually you're just like, okay, good enough, that's it. And I think that theme of it's good enough um, during virtual exams was quite common. Despite the recently imposed need and ability to implement telemedicine, Ongoing attention is warranted to ensure that access is adequately balanced with quality. That being said, the opportunities for training and certificate courses in telemedicine are growing. The Association of American Medical College reports that a little more than half of all, us, all US schools had telemedicine as a required or an elective course during the 2016-2017 academic year. I'm certain that these opportunities will continue to grow. Lastly, while research may not be a priority, collecting data on telemedicine efforts will be critical in bringing about both payer-based and legislative reforms to encourage and enable wider, wider telemedicine use in the post-COVID world. Variables to consider recording include cost data, such as the cost of onboarding providers and new equipment, utilization rates, including the proportion of completed visits and no-shows, length of encounters, incidents of technical problems, ability to coordinate care for complex patients, patient and provider experience and satisfaction with the telemedicine experience, as well as the travel miles and time saved for patients. As I mentioned earlier, there have been webinars about billing by the AUA and the AAP section on urology, and I've listed the links here, which you'll hopefully be able to access later if you'd like. As reimbursement and coding remains fluid, especially during the COVID pandemic, another good source for such information is the Center for Connected Health Policy. And here is the link. To finish up, I guess ahead of time, um, with regulatory changes, the pandemic has provided the impetus for swift implementation and expansion of telehealth services. Telemedicine visits can now be billed as if the patient was seen in person. We believe that the current situation requires that every non-urgent pediatric urology patient should be considered for a telemedicine visit. Telemedicine may provide benefits for patients, providers, and the environment. The avoided travel results in clear reductions in fossil fuel use and carbon dioxide emissions. Efforts are necessary to determine how telemedicine can be fully integrated into future healthcare delivery. It is likely that a substantial portion of conventional in-person visits can 
practice virtually post the COVID-19 world, but how we decide which those are and how we incorporate that into our practice remains to be seen. This being said, best telemedicine practices are still emerging. Given that telemedicine is here to stay, we believe that telemedicine curricula, including instruction on website manner skills, should be incorporated from the start of medical training. With the pandemic, telemedicine was thrown at us, but it's important that we ensure high quality care and make improvements as best that we can. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions or talk about telemedicine. Hey, Julia, thank you so much. That was a really, really great presentation. So timely, given everything that's going on. And um, yeah, absolutely. Your, your, your comment about uh, you know, stumbling into the right place at the right time. Well, not stumbling. You, you worked hard to get where you are. But uh, you're, you were definitely in the right place at the right time, um, working on this for the last three years and then being able to present all of your research now. Um, I think you could swap in pediatric urology for any field of medicine right now and give this exact same presentation and people have a lot to learn. So relevant. Uh, there are a few uh, questions here in the chat. So uh, Dr. Blavis is on here. He said, what are the current regulations regarding first visits for a new patient? For example, 20% of our Lutz patients have polyuria, which for most can be treated without ever seeing the patient. So what do you do for new patient televisits? Yeah, so for right now, at least during the duration of the public health emergency, one of the unique things that has evolved is that you can see new patients via a video or a telephonic visit. So you can see those patients. I can't promise that we'll stay after the pandemic for right now. Um, that is allowed. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Cooper said, um, any sense of future plans uh, regarding allowing us to see patients in another state um, on telemedicine? Uh, also, any sense of whether payers are actually paying for phone visits? So in terms of cross-state bounds, that was a major limitation prior to the pandemic that has been relaxed. Um, there are some, a coalition of states, which New York and the Northeast is kind of not a part of, that already have um, kind of cross-state agreements. And I think that that's probably where the future lies, that there are more of these cross-state coalitions that allow you to see patients outside of state. I don't think where it's fully deregulated right now where you can see across state lines will necessarily stay after the pandemic. Um, but I do think that that's an important thing to advocate for that allows us to really um, spread the use of telemedicine. Yeah, especially at tertiary centers. I'm sure you, you get a lot of patients from New Hampshire and Vermont coming to Boston. I mean, New York, obviously, like we can see New Jersey and Connecticut, you know, if you're on a high building from here. So the, st the state line issue becomes, uh, it seems kind of arbitrary, um, but I guess they need to regulate the issuing medical licensing and stuff like that. Yeah, for us during the pandemic, if you look at our cohort of patients, 87% of them were within Massachusetts. If you include the kind of the tri-state area, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, New Hampshire, all the surrounding states, then you bring it up to 97% of our patient population, and then about 3% is either international or elsewhere throughout the country. So the, mm -hmm. if you just had kind of a, a coalition covering, you know, your region, I think that that would be enough to allow um, practice to continue as it is. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Dr. Ahmed here says, uh, how specifically do you show the patients the results of radiology or labs in telemedicine? And then I'll just tack on, how did you do that great drawing? Because that was some actually pretty good art. Yeah. Well, um, so for us, we will have, obviously during the pandemic, it's a little more troublesome to get radiology. Prior to the pandemic, they would go to any local satellite, even if they were in Maine, they go to Maine hospital and they would just get the images to us and we would um, be able to share our screen and discuss it with them virtually kind of as you saw um, that patient is actually from Maine. Lab results as well, we just make sure to obtain them. We have, or if they are around Boston Children's, they go to their closest satellite and then it's in our system. But we didn't, don't require that they come to us to get that stuff done. We just have to make sure that we, our nurses um, follow it up so it's in our hands and then we can discuss it. And to your question, um, Alex, about the drawings, um, that's Dr. Michael Kurtz. He's a wonderful artist, actually, and he has a ThinkPad, and he uses that for his virtual visits, and that's how he's able to share his drawings as well, and that's been a fan favorite for sure. 
Yeah, that, that seems really useful. What software are you using for your televisits? So yeah, we have, um, it's a homegrown platform that's a combination of SBR Health and, and video. Um, and that was what we were using prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic, there has been some use of Zoom as well, which I know oh, interesting. a lot of controversy about, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess if you go into a private meeting, you're not gonna get anyone Zoom bombing you, but uh, it is apparently less secure. Is there any regulation on or restriction on what platforms you can specifically use? I mean, at, at Mount Sinai, most people are using the integrated um, Epic uh, software uh, where the patient can log in through my chart and it's security. Um, but Dr. Cooper just brought up, um, you know, Doximity is out there now that you can use and yeah. some people are using FaceTime. So right now during the public health emergency, there are no restrictions. You can use FaceTime, you can use Skype. I wouldn't recommend them though. I think Doximity and Zoom are in that middle category where they're okay. Um, they're not as secure as using, you know, a dedicated uh, platform, but they're, they, I think that they are in the intermediate category where they would be approved in the long term, whereas Skype and FaceTime definitely, they technically are allowed right now, but uh, in the long term definitely should not be acceptable options since they're easily hackable with public, uh, private health information being shared. Yeah, interesting. Um, I love this concept of website manner. I think that that's really important and even on Zoom calls, you know, business call or like, uh, you know, faculty meetings or et cetera, you can kind of tell who has a good website manner and who needs to have a little work on it. And, and your, that table you showed is really nice. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna retweet that out because I think a lot of people need to see that. Um, you know, I think proper lighting is important, you know, like having, I've even seen people install like, um, a light either on their desk to kind of give them some ambient light. Uh, before we were talking about, um, you know, resident and fellowship interviews during uh, this time, a lot of those uh, points that you brought up apply to that too. You know, I think um, people should take a look at that because it's going to be important for them to, on their interviews, kind of how they're perceived. If you're if you're fidgeting and you're biting your fingers, it's kind of like emphasized uh, over Zoom, over a video call. Yeah, it can look much more dramatic over a video call. Yeah, how have you found the the quality on the patient end? Are you able to um, are you able to kind of like get good quality from most patients? So again, it's very like bandwidth internet dependent. So if they have bad internet, the quality of the image coming across can be. Um, blurry and that can be a struggle. So it's somewhat dependent upon what their you what their internet is. It also the other thing that's come up is if you're using a desk computer that's not movable and you're trying to show the baby, you're like lifting the baby up in front of the. <laughs> um, there's some pretty funny stories about that. So a lot of the families have found that you know using a mobile device it's easier to show what you need to show on a physical exam. Um, Interesting. But yeah, it can also be shaky and bring its own challenges. So. Absolutely, I've said, uh, uh, as you know, my wife Joyce is a pediatric ophthalmologist, and she's been doing a lot of telemedicine, and she keeps having the the mom cover the baby's eyes to try to examine the the crossing eyes, and it can be it can be kind of comical to watch her do that. <laughs> the ophthalmologist in my focus group actually said he uses the siblings for his eye exams, so he'll have the he'll tell the sibling if they have an older sibling to kind of like run back and forth so that the baby is like tracking them, and he'll he's using the surroundings to help him with his exam, which I thought was very creative. Yeah, very creative. Um, Dr. Cooper has a quick question for you. She's, uh, she's on here. Yeah, actually, Julie, that was awesome talk. Um, and I just wanted to put in a couple of comments. You were talking about sort of the pros and cons of telehealth. And from my own experience, there are two vignettes that really stick with me. And sort of one of them particularly helped early on in the pandemic. when we were all feeling very anxious about what was going on in our new roles and sort of everything being taken away from us in terms of our normal routines. So I did a telehealth visit with an established patient of mine who's 95, and she has a phenomenal home health aide who lives with her. And I have to say, like, in the middle of all the stress and everything, it was, it was awesome. It was the cutest thing because she had never done FaceTime before. And her aide was able to direct her and kept saying, look, there's your doctor. And she would wave at me. And we just had a really cute interaction. And there wasn't much going on medically. It was almost like a check-in. 
But I think for me, it may, it sort of like reinforced one of the things I love about medicine, just the interaction. And at a time when we were all feeling particularly stressed and, and had lost so much control, it was, it really brightened my day. And I know for her, it was a really cool experience and she was 95 and it was just, it was a really awesome thing. So with my geriatric practice, practice, I've had a lot of those encounters with the patient population that's been phenomenal. And I never would have envisioned that I would have been able to do that with them. So that was great. Um, and then an, an added bonus, I think, is sometimes you're going to get, it, sometimes there can be distractions at home, but you also can get beneficial input from family members that wouldn't have otherwise come to the office visit. So I have a patient who I've been managing with recurrent UTIs who had been seeing another urologist that had been managed in a different way. And she finally sort of came on board with my philosophy and she's doing great. And in the background, her son, who was, you know, in his 40s or 50s, put his head in like this and said, I just have to tell you that we're so happy that she finally listened to you. We've been trying to get her to do something different. And, you know, I wouldn't have had that interaction if she came to me in the office because he wouldn't have taken the time off from work. You know, she always came on her own. So I think sometimes there are some benefits to seeing somebody in their home environment that we would never appreciate fully in the office. So I've been really, I, I've been novice at this, but I, for me, it's been terrific on many levels. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I think what you're saying with everyone being home, be able to see see the surroundings, that's part of also the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, you know, we had to kind of restructure when we were having our virtual visits because everyone wanted to have them in the morning before they left for work or school or in the evening, which also then extends the provider's hours because they're having a normal day in between and then seeing people at the beginning and their end, sometimes from home. Um, and I think that as we kind of scale back and start to see more people in person after the pandemic, how we kind of integrate it in and still maintain our own uh, wellness will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Julia, do you have any comments on kind of, you know, uh, successful template structures for your clinic days uh, for integrating virtual visits? Because one thing that we've been discussing and trying to figure out um, at Mount Sinai is whether to put the put the video visits to group the video visits together or to intersperse them in between the um, you know live in person patient visits. Um, what what have you guys been doing? So we started with it interspersed throughout the day when it was just those kind of three providers piloting it. And the major feedback was that families wanted it at the start or the end of the day. So what we ended up doing was kind of grouping in the morning between 7.30 and 8.30 before the day would start. And then in the afternoon, kind of four to five-ish would group a set of telemedicine visits um, during those blocks for the provider. And, you know, we actually, at the start of it, some of the providers felt overwhelmed because they said, you know, you're... Um, taking those expedited, quick, easy visits and putting them at the start of end of our day. And then our day itself is all newer, complex patients. And we have none of those like quick patients to catch up in. Um, so, I mean, there's pros and cons to everything you do, but that's, that seemed to be working for us. There is one provider who is, you know, having it more interspersed. So we do have kind of variability with a bunch of different schedulers. So some of it's prior provider specific, but we found the most success with grouping it at the beginning and end of the day. Do you find that when, the, when it's interspersed that the um, sometimes inevitably you're going to fall behind because if you have an in-person visit, that might take longer than anticipated. And you've, you've done this, the questionnaires for the patients in terms of patient satisfaction. Does that ever come up that they might, do they ever bring up the concept that they're sort of on hold for a lengthy time or it doesn't? No, it hasn't really happened. I feel like in the rare circumstances where it does, generally one of our staff members will call out to them. But for the most part, the wait time is pretty minimal. It's like under 10 minutes, which is nothing compared to a, you know, in-person visit, generally speaking. Yeah. And Dr. Blavis has Dr. Blavis here. Can I, can I interject a, que a question? I really enjoyed your talk. But most important thing, I wanted to check my internet presence here with my in my kitchen and see what you all thought, whether I could see patients like that. Um, I'm interested in, um, I, I think it would be a good idea if we develop guidelines about for individual uh, conditions about when physical exam is necessary. Because uh, we, I've been doing tele, the equivalent of televisits, believe it or not, for the, the better part of 15, 20 years. And um, as soon as in the beginning, with or without video. And I've been criticized 
especially in, in men with BPH, far removed from what you're talking about today, they say, oh, well, you always, you, you have to do a phys you have to do a physical exam and you have to examine their prostate first. And I personally don't agree with that. And I don't mean to, um, to discuss it here other than to make the suggestion that, uh, that in a more formal way, we develop guidelines for when physical exam is necessary for a urologist in lots of different conditions. You can think of stone disease, you know, you know that's not acute, you know, uh, any kind of voiding dysfunction, et cetera. That's my only, not hard to answer that today, but just bring it up for, some, for everybody's uh, information, see what you think. A work group or something along those lines. I can tell you that within the papers that I've published, the reviewers always have questions in terms of the uh, physical exam and what we've done. And I think the, the issue is, is that even within providers, within our practice, will feel, have differing levels of comfort of what they think is appropriate or not. You know, one provider will see everyone virtually try to have the caregiver manipulate the exam, do the best they can, and then you know, bring them in if not, whereas another provider, you know, won't see undescended testicles or hypospadias via virtual visit because he thinks, you know, I need to see that in person. So, I mean, I definitely think it's worth having a work group to look at different conditions and kind of better define best practices for that. But I, I definitely think there'll be a lot of um, variation and diff difficulty coming to a standard. Julia, maybe you can comment on your Presumably you have some kind of template physical exam that you do over video where you comment on the appearance of the patient, whatever their skin, um, to hit a num you know, that number of systems. Can you go over what you typically include? The same, honestly, that I would do for an for a in-person visit, except for I'm not palpating it myself. So I make sure to include that, you know, the care caregiver you know, touch the abdomen and it was soft and appeared, you know, flat. And then same for the exam. Like if they help to, you know, I can say circumcised or uncircumcised, but if they're helping me with a, with the testicular exam, like I'll just document that. But I try to cover the same systems. Great. You know, Julia, uh, with any of your adult colleagues, this would seem like it gets a little dicey, particularly on the, those platforms like uh, FaceTime <laughs> or Zoom that aren't protected. Are the older women getting vaginal exams sort of visually? Have you heard of that at all? Yeah, so our GYN, um, this came up in our in the focus group that I led. We had two um, peds gynecologists there and they are seeing adolescent females and they even post-op when they have the dilators in and they're walking them through dilators. They One safety that they have is they have the social worker call them after the virtual visit and check in and make sure they felt comfortable and how did that go for you? And I thought that that was like kind of a nice checkpoint. And they also try to be very firm in when they're doing the visit and say, you know, this is okay because I am your doctor. Like, don't go doing this, you know, in <laughs> settings. Because it, it is kind of a slippery slope when you're um, doing those kind of exams over something like FaceTime or virtual media. Um, but they are doing it successfully. That's fantastic that the social workers are checking in. I mean, Jerry, our patient population is a little different. I think it would be a little challenging doing it. But I think particularly for those adolescent girls, the concept to reinforce this is different. It's okay because it's your doctor doing it. It's very important. But th that for me is one of the hurdles. That came up quite a bit, actually, that sometimes providers, they were there was cross-pollination because not all the providers were saying that. And they're like, I guess I should be saying, you know, when, that, when they're in the office, they say, it's okay, Bobby, I'm the doctor and your parents are here, so I'm doing this. And that necess doesn't necessarily happen virtually because it's just a different setting. And I think that one of the learnings was that providers felt they should still be doing that over the camera, if not more. I think that's great. I think it's great to have people checking in on them after just for their emotional state to make sure they were comfortable with the situation. It's a learning for all of us. Yes, definitely. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. Uh, yeah, Julia, thanks again. That was a really great talk. Very relevant. Um, the recording of it is going to get posted to our YouTube page, so you can... Uh, share it with all of your friends. <laughs> but I think it's actually really important for um, a lot of urologists to learn more about this topic. I think this is our new reality, like a lot of uh, things that we're going through right now. And this is uh, something that we all need to kind of quickly uh, master. I actually have a virtual visit with my primary care doctor at nine o'clock. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, Julie, that was fantastic. And we also want to uh, announce, obviously, that we are welcoming, we look forward to welcome you back to the New York section in just about a month. Well, Julie will be back on faculty at Columbia, so we're very excited to have her back. Thank you. I can't wait.